um, educated at the University of Illinois and DePaul University, Veronica Drans, earned a PhD in animal physiology and has taught science to medical professionals most of her life. Formerly a tenured full professor, founder of Chicagoland's first electroneurodiagnostic technology college degree program, creator of curricula and numerous courses for scientific and medical programs, and popular public speaker on anatomy and physiology to the medical community, Veronica is currently on the faculty of an anesthesia program in a major university and hospital, where she continues to teach anesthetics for the 37th year. Dr. Drance has reviewed the scientific literature accumulated over, over the last 50 years on intersexuality, sexual orientation, and sexual identity. She speaks to the public about this research and its social implications. Veronica Drance, welcome. <clears throat> Thank you, Svetlana, and uh, good morning, everyone, and thank you for coming to hear this story entitled, Myths and Science of Sexuality, Disordered or Just Different? And I'm going to begin with the myth of sexuality. Yeah, the Adam and Eve story, which uh, as a biologist, I have a lot of problems with, but the part that uh, is most problematic uh, uh, for today's uh, presentation is the gender binary. This is something that uh, intersex and transsexual people talk about a lot. Uh, and uh, this gender binary is a notion that's implicit in the Adam and Eve story, that there are only two groups of people, the Adams and the Eves. And if, you know, that all the people that are in the Eves category are more or less alike, and all the people that are in the Adam category are more or less alike, I don't know where this idea came from, that you could have a population of organisms that result from sexual reproduction and they fall into just two groups. Uh, I think it comes from the idea that there's only two kinds of gametes and most of, them just, most of us make just one or the other. So certainly the gametes are binary in the sense that there's only eggs and sperm and I've never heard of anything sort of in between an egg and a sperm, okay? So the gametes are binary, but the organisms, the people that make the gametes are not binary. And now I want to tell you the scientific story that explains the incredible diversity we see in human sexuality. And the name for the mechanism that physiologists have discovered that explains this diversity is called the organization activation mechanism. Sometimes it's also referred to as the prenatal hormone theory. And uh, this theory has two major ideas. One, that the, not only the genitalia, but the brain is organized sexually before birth. And then later in life, at puberty, the hormones cause activation, not only of the genitalia, as we well know, but of these brain systems as well. So now I'm going to explain to you what we know about the development of genitalia in mammals. And this uh, part of the story is an old part of the story that physiologists have known for a long time that I knew before I started this uh, project. And uh, here we're looking at a picture of the internal genitalia, and you can see that mammals start out as hermaphrodites. We start out with the beginnings of both male and female systems. Uh, this uh, darker uh, set of organs is called the Mullerian system, and if it develops, it will develop into the female organs, the oviduct and the uterus. And uh, this other system in the light pink is the Wolfian system, and if it develops, it becomes the vas uh, deferens and the prostate and other uh, internal organs of the male. Uh, so we start out with both systems internally, uh, but normally only one system persists. What about the external genitalia? Well, for the first six weeks, we all look alike, and we call that the indifferent stage. Starting at about the seventh or eighth week, you can begin to see differences between male and female. Notice that we have only one set of external genitalia. It is not possible to have both a clitoris and a penis at the same time, for example, because both the penis and the clitoris come from the same primordial structure. And the scrotum and the uh, labia majora, for example, also come from exactly the same structure. So you can have only one or the other not both. Or you can have something sort of intermediate, which I will show you soon. All right, so how is it that we turn out either as male or female or something uh, in between? 
let's, and this is the most important slide. You have to follow this to follow everything that comes after it. We'll start on the right, which is the female. Uh, and this is going to be a typical female because uh, the individual is getting an X chromosome from both the egg and the sperm. The gonad could become either an ovary or a testes. It has the potential to be either one. But in the female, without a Y chromosome, it'll automatically become an ovary. So no special instructions. This will develop into an ovary. And in the female, the uh, little girl fetus, that ovary does not secrete hormones. Not necessary. Because the mammalian body simply wants to be female. The mammalian body plan is inherently female. This is true for all mammals. So in the absence of any special instructions, you will get a female. We say the female is the default sex. And the ovaries do not secrete hormones to any significant degree until puberty, at which time the female develops a secondary sex characteristic, such as the breast, for example. Okay. Uh, now let's go to the male, who's more complicated in this case. And we're going to get a typical male because there's a Y chromosome in the sperm. And what is important about the Y chromosome for maleness is one gene in a region called the SRY, the sex-determining region of the Y chromosome. And this gene codes for a protein that is a transcription factor, which means it's going to cause a lot of other genes to be expressed. And when those genes get expressed, they will make proteins. Genes are like recipes for proteins, OK? The DNA is really recipe for proteins. And the proteins are the molecules that are at the heart of anything and everything that happens in a living thing. Anyway, this protein that comes from the SRY gene is going to cause the testes to develop. So the gonad will become a testes if there's a Y chromosome around. And this testes will secrete hormones in the male fetus. Two hormones. Mullerian inhibiting substance, which you can tell from the name, is going to inhibit the Mullerian system, which is the female system. Notice the male has to make a hormone to stifle the femaleness. Then the testes makes a second hormone, testosterone. And that's necessary for the male internal genitalia to develop. Oh, I forgot to say, back with the female, I, I failed to mention, that automatically the male system internally withers away, automatically. And the female system develops without any need for any hormones. But in the male, there's a hormone that has to cause the female system to wither away. And another hormone, testosterone, causes the male system to develop. Um, and that same testosterone, a sneak preview of what's to come, also programs the brain in the male direction. And then that testosterone works on the external genitalia, but there's an enzyme in the external genitalia that turns the testosterone into dihydrotestosterone. And that's really the form of the hormone that causes the external genitalia to form. So that little male fetus is spewing out all kinds of hormones. And uh, that is organizing the body and the brain differently than it would uh, be organized in a typical female. And of course, at puberty, the testes make hormones that cause the male secondary sex characteristics. Now, according to the organization activation theory, then, your genitalia are organized before birth. That's pretty obvious. You come into the world, your genitalia already have the configuration that they're going to have. Um, uh, but as we all know, these uh, genitalia are not fully functional until after puberty. And it's during puberty that the genitalia get activated. So we have organization before birth, activation later by hormones in puberty. And this is showing you what we know about the testosterone production in males. Here we see the big surge that occurs during fetal development. There's another surge right after birth. We're not sure what that's all about. And then later in life at puberty, we see a big surge that persists throughout most of uh, that male's life. OK, now here's a little molecular biology. This little uh, sphere represents testosterone. You should think of hormones as being like little molecular keys. They have a particular three-dimensional shape. And in order for this hormone to work, it has to get inside the target cells, and it has to bind to a receptor. So this uh, hormone is like a key, and the receptor is like a lock. Okay? And once the uh, hormone and the receptor bind to each other, they become an active transcription factor which is going to associate with the DNA and cause certain genes to be expressed and proteins to be made. And that will cause this individual to develop like a male. And so we can see that the testosterone and its receptor is causing hormones to be made like you would expect in a male, and sperm production, and the stimulation of the male internal organs. And notice the dihydrotestosterone that's made from the testosterone is required for the external virilization and uh, puberty. 
Well, I hope I have made my case. Physiologists for a long time have said that basically there's really only one sex, and that sex is female. Now, see, Adam, uh, Eve did not come from Adam. Adam came from Eve, so there, OK. Uh, and, and Adam is really an Eve, <laughs> an altered Eve. So the male is an altered female. And every individual body plan is a variation on this female theme. So the female is default. And if the, that uh, body plan is completely altered, then we get a typical male. But it's possible, since hormones have dose-dependent effects, uh, to get somebody who's partly altered. And that would be a kind of intersex person. So everybody falls on some point of a continuum from the female-bodied person, gynomorphic, to a male-bodied person, andromorphic. This body plan is organized by the presence or absence of steroid sex hormones during the critical period of development. Uh, and these sexual systems are activated later by steroid hormones in puberty. Now, as you all know, sex has many levels. There's a genetic sex, which, by the way, um, uh, X and Y chromosomes are found only in mammals. So that has to tell you that the X and Y chromosomes are really not the essence of maleness and femaleness. Okay, since males and females are, are uh, uh, throughout the entire animal kingdom, not just among mammals. And when a biologist says male or female, that is a technical term. It really is. And when I say female, I mean the same thing, whether I'm talking about a female person or a female cockroach uh, or a female frog. It doesn't make any difference. What I mean by female is an egg maker. And that's a whole other talk, uh, eggs versus sperm. Okay, So if you're a female, you're an egg maker. And males are sperm makers. Okay, so when I say male or female, I'm talking about your gonads. I'm talking about whether you have ovaries that make eggs or testes that make sperm. And that, basically, that's all I'm talking about. And I don't mean breasts and I don't mean vagina, because frogs and cockroaches don't have breasts or vaginas, but they definitely are females. Okay, and we can talk about a hormonal sex, you know, which is more uh, abundant, uh, testosterone or estrogen. We can talk about the somatic sex, obviously, your anatomy and physiology. We can also talk about psychological sex, somebody's sexual identity and sexual orientation. And as uh, the genitalia, as uh, I've pointed out, are obviously organized before birth. And we obviously don't choose our genetic sex, our gonadal sex, our hormonal sex, or our somatic sex. But what about sexual behavior? Hmm? What about sexual identity? What about sexual orientation? Are these aspects of sexuality innate or learned? Chosen, even. Is the brain, like the body, organized by the presence or absence of sex hormones before birth? Well, I'm going to show you the highlights of evidence for the organization activation mechanism. And uh, this evidence falls into three major categories. The David Reimer story, evidence from intersex people, and brain work on uh, animals and uh, humans. Two people who are central to this whole story are John Money and Milton Diamond. John Money was an advocate of the neutrality at birth theory. He was a psychologist who, who claimed that we come into the world with a brain that's sexually blank, and that we learn our sexuality, that we have no innate instinctive basis for our sexuality. And, uh, and in order to develop uh, sexually in a normal way, according to John Money, it was important to have conventional looking genitalia because you come into the world with these genitalia, the world looks at your genitalia, and they treat you according to the genitalia, and that's how you learn your identity, by the way the world treats you because of your genitalia. So it was important that you have conventional genitalia, although there was, we now realize in retrospect, never any evidence to support any of this, and uh, any uh, research that he did turned out to be very flawed. His adversary and what turned out to be his nemesis is Milton Diamond, who was an, a biologist. And because he was a biologist, he has an evolutionary view, and that's why he, was, he turned out to be right. <laughs> uh, the sexuality at birth theory says that the prenatal genetic and hormonal influences predispose us at birth to a, a male or female sexual identity, that we have a built-in bias to interact with the world in a certain way according to a certain gender role, and we're not neutral. We're not without initial direction. And he was, over the years, as the science came in, he became a leading proponent of the organization activation mechanism. 